Now, the DOLAB study, this has been quite a large and long-running study because it had two discrete phases. Although the main aspect of the DHA Oxford Learning and Behaviour Study was indeed a randomised double-blind placebo-controlled trial involving supplementation with an algal source DHA, as I've said, in order to recruit that population and to make sure that we had children who had room to improve, we screened a much larger sample. And those children were all kind enough, as were their parents, to agree to the full battery of study measures. So what I'm presenting to you now, these are actually newly published findings from the DOLAB study, but as I say, they're from the screening stage of the study, and I'll walk you through this, I hope. But it's just been published, this paper, in PLOS One, so this is full open access, low blood long chain omega-3 fatty acids in UK children are associated with poor cognitive performance and behavior. So, as I hope you may have gathered now, this DHA Oxford Learning and Behavior Study, this actually gave us the opportunity to do the first ever study of the blood fatty acid status of mainstream UK school children. It's a large and nationally representative sample, although it was Oxfordshire schools that took part. Um, and the children came from three different year groups, aged broadly seven, eight, and nine. And the study also included very robust measures, objective blood measures of omega-3 status, as well as age-standardized measures of cognition and behavior. Now, I covered the background in my last presentation, so really we can flick this now, that essentially there is already a body of evidence showing omega-3 deficiencies in children with a range of behavior and learning difficulties like ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, etc. There's been, as I covered before the break, some evidence from randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials that giving these kinds of children long-chain omega-3, EPA and or DHA, the exact formulation has differed between different studies, that this kind of dietary supplementation can actually have benefits for children from these sorts of groups. But these are regarded, you see, as clinical conditions. And so many people have said, well, that won't apply to healthy, normal children from the general school population. This was the question that the DOLAB study set out to address. But at this screening stage then, we set out to assess the blood fatty acid status of a large sample of children, only some of whom were going to go on to the treatment trial. We took finger stick samples, just a few drops of blood. This is a technological innovation that's come about in recent years that has allowed from a finger stick sample assessment of the full fatty acid profile. This used to require a venous blood sample. So that was regarded as quite an invasive procedure and really precluded uh, general population studies like this one. And our second aim, having explored just what is the fatty acid status of children in UK schools, was to look to see could we find any associations between blood fatty acids and the children's reading, their working memory, and their behavior as assessed with ADHD type symptom rating scales. So as I say, the screening stage, it was school-based. So we went into schools and the children were assessed there for their reading and their working memory and gave a blood sample, uh, <coughs> if they were willing to do this. And other information, it was parent ratings and teacher ratings uh, were gathered with regard to their behavior. And we also asked parents about their sleep and their general health. So these then are the primary measures from the British ability scales and age standardized, well-validated test battery with very good UK population norms. The ADHD type symptoms, the Connors rating scales, again, well validated, used in numerous trials of stimulant medication for ADHD. And then some secondary outcomes that you'll hear a little about this afternoon. But the blood fatty acids then, finger stick sample, few drops of blood, and then again, I want to offer my thanks to DSM Nutritional Products because they provided not just the test kits, but their expertise and their labs in the US did these fatty acid analyses absolutely blind, of course, in their case, to anything about the rest of the children's data or status. 
So we started then with, really, all the children in Oxfordshire, uh, 38,375 in the years 2009 to 11 that we were recruiting for this study. We started with kids who, at the very first start of school, had been assessed with our key stage national assessments as being just below average on literacy skills. But that was long ago, given that some of these children were nine years old or nearly ten by the time we saw them. So we did current assessments of their reading. And 74 schools took part. And from those schools, our total number of children who were invited was nearly 1,400. And then, as is always the case, in the terms of how many parents gave consent, and then the children assented, it was roughly half and half. Into, so we then have a sample of 675 children who were willing to take part in this study and whose parents gave fully informed consent. So the blood sampling, as I say, 675 children and a remarkable proportion of children, 596 of them were more than willing to give a sample of this kind. It was only 79 who said, no, I don't want to do the blood sample bit of this, which of course is entirely a decision for them. Uh, sadly, and this was sadly, um, we lost quite a lot of blood data in processing. Either not enough blood, not all the children could provide enough drops of blood, it's about just a few drops needed. Um, so that left us with a data set of just under 500 children, 493, but that is a goodly sized sample of children from mainstream schools. Now, just to give you the characteristics of that sample, who were the children who we actually finished up with data on that included these all-important blood fatty acid measures. Firstly, age, as I've said. These children came from three school year groups and pretty well balanced between those year groups who are broadly seven, eight, and nine. The sex ratio, slightly more boys than girls, but if you're going to focus on starting with children who even once upon a time were having a bit of difficulty at the very beginning of learning to read, that will tend to give you more boys than girls. With socioeconomic status, our index there was eligibility for free school meals, and our sample matched pretty closely the national average there. And when it came to ethnicity, here is the one dimension where we don't have a nationally UK representative sample for the simple reason one of our criteria was that English must be the first language spoken at home. If you're going to use reading measures, you want to avoid any confounds of English being a second language. So it was a predominantly white sample. Now, how did these children compare with the national average for reading? This is really important because it often gets misunderstood here. By no means, when we tested them, were all of these children poor readers. In fact, about a third of the sample were actually above average readers. So they did not go on into the treatment trial that you'll be hearing about next. But what we've essentially got, it is a slightly left shifted distribution. This, the red curve here, is the distribution of reading abilities from above average to below average in the whole of the UK. It's slightly left shifted, but I want to emphasize the mean for this sample is just over 90 on these standardized scores. That is within the general population range. So we do believe that this is a representative sample of children. They were not all poor readers. Now, what did we find then with regard to their blood fatty acids? Here is the distribution of DHA in whole blood in these children, with an average of just under 2% of their total fatty acids in blood was DHA. And as you can see, there's quite a nice wide distribution of scores here. We've got good variance, to use the scientific term. If we look at EPA, this is the other long chain omega-3 that you'll find in fish and seafood. It's not so commonly, it's not a structural fat in membranes, for goodness sake. So the mean here, it's about what you might expect, it's only about half a percent. Um, but it's quite a narrow range as well, and the odd outlier in this distribution. Now, this chart of what's essentially the data I've shown you already, the DHA, the EPA, this comes from the actual open access paper. You can all download this for yourselves. But this, to scale, really shows you why there really isn't much variability in EPA. Really, there isn't. DHA is the one 
that varies, and that has quite a good distribution. When you add the two together, EPA plus DHA, these are the long chain omega-3. They're the ones that matter biologically. And this EPA plus DHA, it's actually known as the omega-3 index in some quarters. When you add up the percentage of EPA and DHA in blood cells, now, very strictly, it's actually the red cells only. Our finger stick samples are whole blood, so we've got red cells and plasma. So for fatty acid purists, they're not identical, but the omega-3 index, EPA plus DHA, in adults, this is a very well-validated marker of risk for cardiovascular disease. And I hope you've all <clears throat> looked at the color coding here, that anywhere below 4% EPA plus DHA, you are at high risk for heart disease and stroke. Four to eight, well, average. But if you want to be at low risk for these things, you really want your blood EPA plus DHA to be above 8%. And in some of the traditional Japanese and Icelandic, you'll find people with 12% or more with the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease. That is where our UK school children fall. 246 well, I think that's quite an alarming finding, to be honest, and this is the first study that's ever been able to look at and sample and find out what is the long-chain omega-3 status of UK school children. If they were adults, they'd be at high risk for heart disease. Now, <clears throat> why have they got such low blood omega-3? We did ask the parents to tell us whether the children ate fish, not at all, quite a lot, very much, etc. Nearly nine in 10 of these children did not meet current dietary guidelines for fish and seafood consumption, which basically say two portions a week. 9% were reported not to eat fish at all. So there's really no surprises here. They're not eating the fish and seafood, and their blood omega-3 are way down on what's considered optimal. This is just the table from the paper looking at the actual correlations between the fish consumption and the different uh, fatty acid measures, but I've taken into a table here for you the key findings here. Children with higher reported fish consumption had higher blood concentrations, very slightly, of the short chain alpha linolenic, but quite frankly, it's DHA. We didn't even find that fish consumption correlated with blood EPA. EPA doesn't tend to be stored in cell membranes. It's a functional fat, not a structural one. DHA the long-chain omega-3 that makes up such a proportion of brain tissue, it is both a structural and a functional fat. And when you look at children's fish consumption, my goodness, it shows up in their blood DHA. We also found, <clears throat> now looking to address our question too, does the blood omega-3 of UK children reflect their behavior and their cognition? We found there was a significant correlation, a positive correlation between their blood DHA concentrations and their reading as measured by our research team using age standardized measures. So <clears throat> the children with the higher blood DHA were the better readers and the lower your blood DHA, the worse your reading. The working memory measures, now anyone familiar with British ability scales may know that the digit span it's actually the ability to recall a string of numbers that are presented to you through the auditory, and you have to repeat them back. It was digit span forwards, auditory, sequential working memory that was linked with DHA. We did not find a relationship with the backward digit span, which is interesting. That's where you've got to repeat that string of numbers in reverse order. That means you've got to do a bit more processing of it. It's not a simple hold it in mind, it came in through your ears, and give it back out again. It was this measure that correlated really quite strongly in terms of what you'd expect from a study of this kind with blood DHA. Again, we think this is interesting because working memory is one of your most important cognitive functions involved in learning to read. So the link between, and we do find correlations between reading and working memory, everyone does whenever they're both assessed. Now, the children's behavior, we had these ADHD-type symptoms, but I want to emphasize, these were healthy children from the general population, and on average, this sample was absolutely within the general population range 
on these measures. This was not an ADHD population. However, all of these symptoms occur on a degree. I think everyone knows that their children can sometimes be oppositional or hyperactive or a bit anxious or restless or impulsive or have mood swings. What we found here was that the parent ratings of these kinds of behavior and attention, some learning problems, the parent ratings of these were indeed strongly related to the children's objectively measured blood DHA. And again, it was DHA that stood out amongst all the fatty acids as the one which related to these. So the higher your blood DHA, the fewer the parent-rated behavior problems. Now, we also did adjusted analyses. Please go to the full paper for all the endless analyses. And I want to pay special tribute to Tay Spreckelson, our co-author, without whom these analyses would certainly not have uh, been done as efficiently, swiftly, if they'd seen the light of day at all. But having corrected for sex, socioeconomic status, we found that the oppositional tendencies, the anxious, psychosomatic symptoms, and the general ADHD rating, these associations still held. So these appear to be quite robust. For teacher ratings, let me say, the teachers don't usually know the kids very well. Only anxiety, and only on the unadjusted. That was the only one. High anxiety went with low blood DHA, according to teacher ratings. So to summarize, in this first ever study looking at the blood omega-3 concentrations of children from a general UK mainstream school population, we found very low concentrations of these long-chain omega-3 that are already known to be critical for physical health, for heart health, for immune system health. And in adults, the concentrations we found in these children were so low that they would all be at high risk for heart disease. I think that's a pretty striking finding. Nine out of 10 kids didn't meet current dietary guidelines for fish consumption. Perhaps no surprises there, but there's a lot of work to be done. And lower blood DHA was associated with poorer reading, poorer working memory on this auditory repetition <coughs> task, and more parent-rated, but not teacher-rated behavior problems. So to conclude, I think we certainly feel further investigations of this really quite simple measure with finger stick testing. This is actually quite a simple test to do now. That omega-3 status, I think this is something that really we should be monitoring and that health service providers should be getting onto their radar. Now, I hope we all know that correlation is not causation. So associations like these, just finding that low blood omega-3 goes with poor reading, poor memory, poor behavior, that is never enough to demonstrate a causal link. For that, you need the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. But these findings certainly do suggest that it might be that improving omega-3 status might improve these children's behavior and learning. And you'll be hearing a little more about that shortly. But I want to thank and give acknowledgement to certainly, I think most of our DOLAB team are indeed here and in particular, Paul Montgomery, who you're about to hear from, my <laughs> longtime colleague and collaborator. He was also a co-author on the Oxford-Durham study, uh, and I'm delighted that didn't put him off this very controversial area. Instead, he went on with me to do this DOLAB study. Jenny Burton, Richard Sewell, and Tace Freckelson. And Oxfordshire Local Authority, we had a data-sharing agreement with them. They couldn't have been more helpful in helping us to get this study done. And of course, all of the schools and all of the children and their parents who helped with this. And then for funding and for analyses of the blood data, DSM Nutritional Products, many thanks to that company. Obviously, it's an Oxford University study, and therefore, uh, I've been pleased to report a complete abiding by the hands-off, the researchers do the study. But we could not have done this without, obviously, the funding, the product, which is used in the treatment trial you'll hear about next, and I want to give special mention to the Waterloo Foundation. They're a small but very innovative charity that have supported my work in this area for some years and have also been supporters of fat research. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any burning questions for Alex on the screening population? Yes, um, if you just wait for the mic, it will come over. Uh, just a bit of clarification on what might be 
you know, coincidental versus correlated in your, in your study. Um, you've mentioned that you had uh, done some uh, uh, um, measurements around children and obviously their social economic background. Uh, could be assumed that children that come from, you know, middle class or upper middle class backgrounds may have a better aptitude to read just because of their general exposure to words and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much clear. And, a lot of the data that's in, and those people may be, or those children may be exposed to fish a little bit more just because of the means to buy, you know, wild fish and therefore their DHA levels may be a bit higher. How do you, how, how did you, you know, look at that when you were doing your assessment to make sure that it was, there was a real correlation between DHA and reading levels? Absolutely. Thank you very much for seeking clarification on that. The data we had, it was limited to the... Uh, local authorities' data on their eligibility for free school meals. That was our index of socioeconomic status. We actually found no significant association between that and the blood DHA measures, which was interesting. We did find, as expected and as you say, that there was an association with reading and also with working memory. Those were controlled for in our adjusted analyses. So yes, the link between low blood DHA and poor reading was independent of socioeconomic status. But thank you for flagging that up, because we do all know that income inequalities are indeed a factor in child behavior and learning problems, and also in the access to good nutrition. But yeah, it was controlled for. Hello. The, um, the difference between what you, the figure you gave for uh, an adequate amount, 12% and so on, and the, the amount these children had was, was pretty remarkably, seems pretty large. Mm. Um, do you have any kind of measure of how much difference the levels made to the reading? I mean, if, if a kid had 2% versus a kid on 8%, is there a kind of stepwise improvement in the reading, or how big a difference does it make? It's a very good question. We didn't have any children who were anywhere near 8%. This was really quite remarkable. I could try to flick back, but in fact, it's in the open access paper. But if you look at the actual distributions, you know, and we've shown those in order that you can see, there were, as you saw, a few outliers on EPA, that's only half a percent. There were almost no outliers on DHA. When you added the two together to get this omega-3 index, quite frankly, we didn't have a child who even made 5%. They hold, so we had a restricted range of scores for both the blood DHA and for the reading to some extent, although in this screening sample, as I flagged up, some of these children were above average readers. So quite honestly, with such a restricted range of blood DHA, we have no idea what might be optimal here. None of the children in this sample were getting there. But for the general population of adults that have been studied and on whom the omega-3 index has been developed, and that's across countries, you don't often find many people getting anywhere near that 8% plus that would put you at the lowest risk. As I say, it tends to be the Japanese, the Icelanders, and people eating that Mediterranean-type diet and avoiding the processed foods that are rich in the omega-6. Hmm? I don't know of any data that actually address this, sadly. It used to be said, of course, that there was no dyslexia in Japan when I was first doing dyslexia research. It turned out not to be quite the case, so, you know, there are cultural factors that come into this. But yeah, I don't know of any data that address that, Jerome, but thank you for the question. Last one. Uh, <clears throat> Alex, the, um, can you make any comment about the, the uh, parent-related behaviour and the teacher-related mm. behaviour? Thank you, Simon. Yes, I can. This really is a bit of a difficulty when one's doing school studies in hard-pressed UK schools these days where certainly it has stopped me from wanting to do studies with these sorts of ratings in the secondary school age range. I would love to do those studies. I think that is an age group that we really need some data on. But quite frankly, the teachers don't know the children anymore. Certainly by the time we get to secondary school and you're rotated around different classes to find any teacher who's actually able to give anything like an accurate rating. I think in primary school that probably applies less, but I do feel that the people who are going to know children best are likely to be their parents. So although with a school-based study it would be negligent of us not to assess the teacher ratings, they exist, let's use them, but we did not find you know, the kinds of relationships in the teacher ratings of these children that we found in the parents' ratings. Not to, not to do with 
uh, whether the child is in a parent situation or a teacher. Well, this is it. You see, there are all kinds of influences on children's behavior. And as I know you'll be aware, with things like ADHD and other behavior type problems, they often distinguish between externalizing, as in the rest of the world does get to know about this because the child is acting out, is hyperactive, impulsive, disruptive, things that I think you would expect the teacher to pick up more than what they call the internalizing, the ADD, attention deficit disorder, daydreaming child, or the anxiety, although it was interesting. That was the one thing that the teachers did. In the teacher ratings, we did find a link between the teachers' ratings of the children's anxiety and their blood omega-3. And that actually has shown up across many other conditions studied, and omega-3 deficiency tends to go with anxiety, depression, and these internalizing symptoms. But yeah, teachers and parents have very different perspectives, but it's why in any assessment of any child's behavior and learning, you want as many perspectives as you can. Thank you. <laughs>